Death on the Nile is one of Agatha Christie's more famous mystery novels for a reason. It takes place in one of the most enchanting places on the planet, aboard a steamer vessel cruising slowly down the River Nile. On this vessel are one murderer and nearly a dozen other suspects, each of whom has a secret, which they're trying to keep hidden under the watchful eye of Hercule Poirot, the world's greatest detective. But as a mystery writer, I've got just one question. Can I solve it? Hey guys, I'm Jane Kalmus, and I think I can beat Agatha Christie at her own game. I am going to be listening to the audiobook for Death on the Nile, the latest Agatha Christie novel to be adapted into a movie, and I'm going to be trying to solve it at the same time. I have to say that this video is completely inspired by Emmy, who did an amazing video trying to solve an Agatha Christie novel, and so I'm going to take a little page from her book, try to solve the mystery, and hopefully we'll all have a lot of fun. All right, so we've been introduced to a couple of characters. Lynette Doyle is my early pick for the victim, and that's because everybody's actions seem to be revolving around her. Everybody's talking about her. She's got a lot of money. She's rich. She's glamorous. Uh, and I think she's gonna die. And we've also met her dear friend, Jackie DeBelfort. And Jackie has just become engaged, and she wants Lynette to give her fiancé a job because they don't have any money. Lynette, Jackie ran to her. This is Simon. Simon, here's Lynette. She's just the most wonderful person in the world. Lynette saw a tall, broad-shouldered young man with very dark blue eyes, crisply curling brown hair, a square chin, and a boyish, appealing, simple smile. And as she turned to lead the way, she thought, I'm frightfully, frightfully happy. I like Jackie's young man. I like him enormously. And then a sudden pang. Lucky Jackie. All right, that is trouble brewing. So then we cut to Egypt. Uh, Lynette has, in fact, married Simon, and they are there enjoying their honeymoon while poor Jackie is presumably off somewhere just licking her wounds. Uh, also in Egypt is Hercule Poirot, the world's greatest detective, and the beginnings of what we can see is going to be the gathering of suspects. There's Tim Allerton, a gentleman in poor health who travels all over the world with his mother. There's the Otterborns. Salome Otterborn is apparently a washed up romance writer and her long suffering daughter, Rosalie, who takes care of her but isn't too happy with the way she keeps uh, drawing attention to herself and self aggrandizing about her writing. Lynette Doyle and her husband came down the path. Lynette's voice was happy and confident. The look of strain and tenseness of muscle had quite disappeared. Lynette was happy. The girl, who was standing there, took a step or two forward. The other two stopped dead. Hello, Lynette, said Jacqueline de Belfort. So here you are. We never seem to stop running into each other. Hello, Simon. How are you? Lynette Doyle had shrunk back against the rock with a little cry. Simon Doyle's good-looking face was suddenly convulsed with rage. He moved forward as though he would have liked to strike the slim, girlish figure. Poirot moved delicately in the opposite direction. As he went, he heard Lynette Doyle say, Simon, for God's sake, Simon, what can we do? Apparently, Jackie has been following Lynette and Simon everywhere they go, uh, to this place on their honeymoon, that place, and finally she's followed them to Egypt. So Lynette hates this. Lynette is used to being in charge. She's used to being able to solve any problem, but she can't seem to stop Jacqueline from just following them around and saying hello to them and not threatening them in any way, but still making them miserable because they can't enjoy this honeymoon when they know, in fact, they've done her wrong. Lynette wants to hire Poirot to just make this problem go away, uh, but he refuses to work for her. And However, he does kind of want to help Jackie, so he's going to talk to her and we're going to listen to that right now. We loved each other and I loved Lynette. I trusted her. She was my best friend all her life. Lynette has been able to buy everything she wanted. She's never denied herself anything. When she saw Simon, she wanted him, and she just took him. And he allowed himself to be bought? Jacqueline shook her dark head slowly. No, it's not quite like that. There's such a thing as glamour, Monsieur Poirot, and money helps that. Lynette had an atmosphere, you see. She was the queen of a kingdom, the young princess luxurious to her fingertips. She made a sudden gesture. Look at the moon up there. 
You see her very plainly, don't you? She's very real. But if the sun were to shine, you wouldn't be able to see her at all. It was rather like that. I was the moon. When the sun came out, Simon couldn't see me anymore. And now we're going to hear Poirot talk to Simon. There is nothing then of the old feeling left? My dear Monsieur Poirot, how can I put it? It's like the moon when the sun comes out. You don't know it's there anymore. When once I'd met Lynette, Jackie didn't exist. Okay, so Jackie and Simon both use the exact same metaphor to describe the whole situation. Lynette is the sun and Jackie is the moon. So I just feel like this is going to be coming back at some point. So now we're aboard the Karnak, which is a steamer traveling down the River Nile, and we've got all the suspects on board. We've got Lynette, we've got Simon, Jackie, uh, we've got the Otterborns, and we've also got Andrew Pennington, who is apparently Lynette's financial manager. Andrew Pennington works in New York, was very distressed to find out that Lynette was married, and in fact came here to ambush her in some way. He's pretending that it's all just a coincidence that he was here just for his own vacation, but in fact he wants something from Lynette. So let's see if we can find out what that is. Pennington came back. He brought with him a sheaf of closely written documents. Mercy, cried Lynette. I gotta sign all these? That's just the transfer, said Pennington. You needn't read it. But Lynette took a brief glance through it. Pennington laid down a third paper. Again, Lynette perused it carefully. They're all quite straightforward, said Andrew. Nothing of interest, only legal phraseology. I always read everything through, said Lynette. Father taught me to do that. He said that there might be some clerical error. Pennington laughed rather harshly. <laughs> You're a grand woman of business, Lynette. Well, she's much more conscientious than I'd be, said Simon, laughing. I've never read a legal document in my life. I sign where they tell me to sign on the dotted line, and that's that. Pennington has a bunch of papers he wants Lynette to sign, and he doesn't like the fact that she's looking them over carefully. Meanwhile, Simon says he'll sign anything Pennington wants. So this might be looking like an opportunity to Pennington. Most of our cast of characters is now going to visit the Temple of Abu Simbel, and this feels like a great stagey location for a little murder. Lynette and Simon passed on. They had no wish to return to the boat, and they were weary of sightseeing. They settled themselves with their backs to the cliff and let the warm sun bake them through. How lovely the sun is, thought Lynette. How warm, how safe, how lovely it is to be happy. How lovely to be me, 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 Lynette. I don't like Lynette. There was a shout, people running towards him, waving their arms, shouting. Simon stared stupidly for a moment. Then he sprang to his feet and dragged Lynette with him. Not a minute too soon, a big boulder hurtling down the cliff crashed past them. If Lynette had remained where she was, she would have been crushed to atoms. All right, we've got our first crime for the book. And the first question I want to ask is, who is the intended victim of this attack? Now, the obvious victim, the one this whole book has set us out to think of as the potential victim, is obviously Lynette. Lynette has the money. Uh, Lynette has everybody's uh, antipathy aiming right towards her. However, Simon, we have to remember that Simon was there too. And Simon also has the money now. He is now married to Lynette. So, could we see a plot where Simon is the intended victim? Uh, this would be what I call a not-so-obvious victim twist, uh, where the book sets you up to think that this person will be murdered, but actually it's this other guy standing right next to her. Maybe, perhaps, Pennington is upset that Lynette got married because one of the people he works with, he's been talking with them about his whole plot of intercepting Lynette. Maybe one of these people is planning to marry Lynette, gain her fortune, and that's what Pennington is here to try and engineer. He's trying to kill Simon. Poirot said quickly, come back to the boat, madame. You must have our restorative. They walked quickly, Simon still full of pent-up rage, Tim trying to talk cheerfully and distract Lynette's mind from the danger she'd run. Poirot with a grave face. And then, just as they reached the gangplank, Simon stopped dead. A look of amazement spread over his face. Jacqueline de Belfort was just coming ashore. Dressed in blue gingham, she looked childish this morning. Good God, said Simon under his breath. So it was an accident after all. All right, one thing we know. It wasn't Jackie. Jackie did not push that stone. The obvious culprit here seems to be Pennington, uh, but we've still got a bunch of other people floating around here. We've got the Otterborns, we've got the Allertons, uh, we've got Mr. Ferguson, who is a communist who keeps talking about how rich people should be shot, uh, and we've got Signor Ricchetti, who is an archaeologist who uh, just seems kind of, 
uh, generally to be getting in a lot of arguments with Ferguson. When the party returned to the Karnak, Lynette gave a cry of surprise. A telegram from me. She snatched it off the board and tore it open. Why, I don't understand. Potatoes? Beetroots? What does it mean, Simon? Simon was just coming to look over her shoulder when a furious voice said, Excuse me, that telegram is for me. And Signor Ricchetti snatched it rudely from her hand, fixing it with a furious glare as he did so. I am so sorry, Signor Ricchetti. You see, my name was Ridgeway before I married, and I haven't been married very long, and so... She paused, her face dimpled with smiles, inviting him to smile upon a young bride's faux pas. But Ricchetti was obviously not amused. Queen Victoria, at her most disapproving, could not have looked more grim. Names should be read carefully. It is inexcusable to be careless in these matters. So I think this is the setup for something that is going to come down later. Uh, first of all, that telegram was weird, right? It, it didn't really seem to have anything to do with archaeology, which is supposedly Ricchetti's uh, profession, and his reaction was also weird. He's overly angry at the fact that she's read his silly farming telegram. So I just, I'm wondering whether there's more to that telegram than meets the eye. So you make the return journey with us, said Poirot as he sipped. You would go faster, would you not, on the government steamer which travels by night as well as day? Colonel Race's face creased appreciatively. You're right on the spot, as usual, Monsieur Poirot, he said pleasantly. It is then the passengers. One of the passengers. Now which one, I wonder, Hercule Poirot asked of the ornate ceiling. Unfortunately, I don't know myself, said Race ruefully. There were three of them. One's dead, one's in prison. I want the third man a man with five or six cold-blooded murders to his credit. He's one of the cleverest paid agitators that ever existed. He's on this boat. I know that from a passage in a letter that passed through our hands. Decoded, it said, X will be on the Karnak trip, February 7th to 13th. It didn't say under what name X would be passing. All right, we've got our second crime, which is these murders that Colonel Race is investigating. So he is looking for a paid agitator who goes by the name of X, and that's going to be one of our passengers. And I'm going to go ahead and call this right now. I really feel like that's Ricchetti. That telegram about potatoes and beetroots seems like it could have easily been a code. And again, it didn't have anything to do with Ricchetti's supposed profession. As a writer, I really love this tactic of introducing a clue before we introduce the question that it's going to answer. So as a reader, I simply was not looking for a spy when I heard that telegram about beetroots. Uh, and so it might be hard for me to put those th two things together if I wasn't paying quite so much attention. So we're back aboard the Karnak enjoying an evening of bridge and drinks and good food. And Marie Van Schuyler's stole has gone missing. Marie Van Schuyler is sort of a horrible old woman who is on a tour of Egypt and she's brought her young niece Cornelia along for the ride, mostly so that she has somebody who she can boss around. She also travels with a nurse, Miss Bowers, who doesn't seem to have a lot of compassion for her, but does have some secret that she's hiding for Marie Van Schuyler. We heard this alluded to in the very first pages of the novel. Cornelia's mother is worried that something will happen while Cornelia is off on holiday with Marie Van Schuyler and Miss Bowers says, oh, don't worry, I always keep a sharp eye out for that. So what that is exactly, we don't know. But right now, Marie Van Schuyler stole is missing and she's bothering everyone about it. And so it is just a little something that we're gonna hang on to and think about later. Most of the characters are gathered in the salon playing bridge. Really, I think I'll go to bed, said Cornelia. It's getting very late. You can't go to bed yet, Jacqueline declared. I forbid you to. Tell me about yourself. Well, I don't know. There isn't much to tell. Cornelia felt flustered. Undoubtedly, Miss de Belfort was drinking too much. That wasn't exactly a novelty to Cornelia. She had seen plenty of drunkenness during Prohibition years. But there was something else. Jacqueline de Belfort was talking to her, was looking at her, and yet, Cornelia felt, it was as though somehow she was talking to someone else. But there were only two other people in the room, Mr. Fanthorpe and Mr. Doyle. Cornelia murmured for the third time, I, I really must. It's so late. You're not to go, said Jacqueline. Her hand shot out and held the other girl in her chair. You're to stay and hear what I've got to say. Jackie, said Simon sharply, you're making a fool of yourself. For God's sake, go to bed. Jacqueline sat up suddenly in her chair. Words poured from her rapidly in a soft, hissing stream. You're afraid of a scene, aren't you? That's because you're so English, so reticent. You want me to behave decently, don't you? But I don't care whether I behave decently or not. You'd better get out of here quickly, because I'm going to talk a lot. I 
told you, said Jacqueline, that I'd kill you sooner than see you go to another woman. You don't think I meant that. You're wrong. Her hand came up suddenly with something in it that flashed and gleamed. I'll shoot you like a dog, like the dirty dog you are. Now at last Simon acted. He sprang to his feet, but at the same moment she pulled the trigger. Simon half twisted, fell across a chair. All right, no mystery about that one. Jackie shot Simon. Simon Doyle still lay as he had fallen half into and across a chair. Jacqueline stood as though paralyzed. She was trembling violently, and her eyes, dilated and frightened, were staring at the crimson stain, slowly soaking through Simon's trouser leg just below the knee, where he held a handkerchief close against the wound. She stammered out, I, I, I didn't mean... Oh, my God, I didn't really mean... The pistol dropped from her nervous fingers with a clatter on the floor. She kicked it away with her foot. It slid under one of the settees. What have I done? What have I done? Cornelia hurried to her. Hush, dear, hush. Simon, his brow wet, his face twisted with pain, said urgently, Get her away. For God's sake, get her out of here. Get her to her cabin, Thanthorpe. Look here, Miss Robson. Get that hospital nurse of yours. He looked appealingly from one to the other of them. Don't leave her. Make quite sure she's safe with the nurse looking after her. Then get hold of old Besner and bring him here. For God's sake, don't let any news of this get to my wife. That seemed weird to anyone else. And now I will give you something to make her sleep. You mustn't blame Jackie. It's been all my fault. I treated her disgracefully. Poor kid, she didn't know what she was doing. Yeah, okay. I don't believe this for a second. Simon has been absolutely unfeeling to Jackie for the entirety of the novel since he abandoned her for Lynette. But now, suddenly that she's shot him, he's super concerned for her. Uh, he's insisting that she not be left alone. This feels entirely wrong. This feels like a setup. It feels actually like he's giving her an alibi. Fanthorpe beckoned him out on the deck. Look here, I can't find that pistol. What is that? The pistol. It dropped out of the girl's hand. She kicked it away and it went under a settee. It isn't under that settee now. They stared at each other. But who can have taken it? All right, my initial thought here is that Simon took that gun. So he's been shot, but could he hobble to the settee and retrieve the gun while Fanthorpe and Cornelia are helping Jackie to her cabin? Uh, perhaps he could, and then maybe he can use that gun for something later. All right, it's happened. Lynette has been killed on the very same evening that Simon and Jackie, I believe, staged this whole confrontation in the salon. What can you tell us, Doctor, about this business? asked Race. Ach, she was shot. Shot at close quarters. See, here, just above the ear. That is where the bullet entered. Very little bullet, I should say, a point two two. The pistol, it was held close against her head. See, there is blackening here. The skin is scorched. Ah, no, Poirot cried out. His sense of psychology was outraged. Jacqueline de Belfort creeping into a darkened cabin, pistol in hand. No, it did not fit that picture. Okay, so maybe Poirot doesn't think that Jackie would commit murder in this way, but I feel certain, I feel certain that she and Simon are behind it. So... To me, in my mind, this book has now become a how done it. I am sure I know who the killer is, but I can't quite figure out how they did it. All right, I think my husband cracked it. Uh, I was talking to him about the book and I explained that I could not figure out how exactly Jackie and Simon had killed Lynette. And he wondered if it might be a time-shifted murder. A time-shifted murder is a murder in which we think the death occurred at a particular time during which the villain actually had an alibi, but in fact the murder happened earlier or later. So right now my theory is that Jackie or Simon killed Lynette earlier in the evening and then staged this big kerfuffle in the salon. Uh, later when she's found dead in the morning, people will think that they both had alibis for the event, but in fact, they didn't. She was killed earlier. No, no, it doesn't work. Uh, I've gone back and reviewed the text and Lynette was in the salon with Jackie and Simon and Cornelia and Fanthorpe and some other people until she went to bed. And after, ja after Lynette goes to bed, neither Simon nor Jackie ever leaves the salon. So it's not a time-shifted murder. And now we have to ask ourselves about all the other kinds of perfect alibi murders that there are. First, we could ask ourselves, is this a time-shifted 
alibi murder. A time-shifted alibi is when we think the alibi took place in a particular window, which coincided with the murder, but in fact it didn't. The murder, the alibi actually started later than it seems to have started. So I don't really see how this could be a time-shifted alibi. Uh, we did see Simon get shot. Another kind of perfect alibi murder is the decoy murder, in which the villain sends somebody else to create his alibi while he himself commits the murder. But I don't see how that could work here. Uh, obviously, Simon and Jackie could not send someone else to represent them in the salon. They're just in too close quarters with the other characters. There's nobody who could resemble them that dramatically as to fool the rest of the guests. We could also ask ourselves if this is a trap murder. That is, if Lynette was set up in some way to trigger her own death once she went into her bedroom. But again, I find that this just doesn't work because the gun is not there. Uh, Lynette was shot very close in the temple while she was sleeping. This doesn't feel like something that she could have triggered accidentally in her own cabin. I will ask you one more question. Did you hear anything, anything at all, after you went to your cabin? Fanthorpe considered. I turned in very quickly. I think I heard a kind of splash just as I was dropping off to sleep. Nothing else. Poirot interviews all the suspects and finds that four characters have heard a splash. However, I think, I think the details don't quite add up. I think there's actually two splashes. Fanthorpe heard a splash when he was dropping off to sleep after the whole ordeal, after helping Simon with his leg. Tim Allerton, however, heard a splash while there was a hullabaloo going on on the deck, and that's the same story that Ferguson tells. So those are different time periods, and I think, I think maybe two things have been thrown overboard. All right, let's just do a little timeline breakdown here. First, Lynette goes to bed, leaving most of the characters in the salon playing bridge. Then there is the incident where Jackie shoots Simon, and sometime during this, some of the characters on the boat hear a splash. Then there is Fanthorpe coming back to the salon, finding that the gun is already missing, and then there is another splash sometime later during the night. So that first splash, I I'm wondering, could Simon have taken the gun and thrown it overboard? Um, I, I don't really see why. Uh, right now, my theory is that Simon has retrieved the gun from under the settee, he has secreted it on his person and allowed himself to be treated for the gunshot wound, and then he's going to creep to Lynette's bedroom sometime in the middle of the night and shoot her. So uh, let's just catch up with Simon. Simon Doyle was lying propped with cushions and pillows and improvised cage over his leg. His face was ghastly in color the ravages of pain with shock on top of it, but the predominant expression on his face was bewilderment, the sick bewilderment of a child. Okay, so my theory is out. Uh, Simon has this cage, this improvised cage over his leg to keep the blanket off of it, and I just, I doubt that a gunshot victim is going to be able to quietly get out of this apparatus, uh, go commit a murder, and then get back into it. So I think Simon has to be guilty of actually pulling the trigger, but I'm just, I'm still convinced that he and Jackie are in on this. Simon stammered. You know, Jackie didn't do it. I'm certain Jackie didn't do it. It looks black against her, I dare say, but she didn't do it. She she was a bit tight last night and all worked up, and that's why she went for me, but she wouldn't. She, she wouldn't do murder, not cold-blooded murder. Yeah, uh, you're convinced too, right? So now I'm wondering if they could have perhaps had a confederate commit the actual murder. And who I'm thinking of here is Miss Bowers. Miss Bowers, if you'll recall, is the nurse who Cornelia and Fanthorpe summoned to help Jacqueline while she was hysterical. So Miss Bowers gives her morphine, she puts her to bed and stays with her all night. So if Miss Bowers is Jacqueline's alibi, well then Jacqueline is Miss Bowers' alibi. In fact, Miss Bowers has no alibi because Jacqueline was unconscious for much of the night. So uh, Miss Bowers could have easily crept out at any time and done the dirty deed. But we would have to ask ourselves why. And is it possible that Jackie and Simon have paid her or perhaps 
Perhaps they have blackmailed her. We know that Miss Bowers has a secret that she is keeping for Marie Van Schuyler, and we don't know what that secret is just yet. So is it possible that Jackie and Simon have ferreted out this information and are using it to put Miss Bowers in a pinch? Now we're going to bring in Lynette's maid, Louise Bourget, and hear her side of the story because she was the last person to see the victim alive. When did you last see Madame Doyle alive? Uh, last night, monsieur, I was in her cabin to undress her. What time was that? It was some time after 11, monsieur. I cannot say exactly when. I undress madame and put her to bed and then I leave. And you heard or saw nothing more that can help us? Uh, but, monsieur, I was nowhere near. What could I have seen or heard? I was on the deck below my cabin. It was on the other side of the boat. Even, it is impossible that I should have heard anything. Naturally, if I had been unable to sleep, if I had mounted the stairs, then perhaps I might have seen the assassin, this monster, enter or leave Madame's cabin. But as it is, she threw out her hands appealingly to Simon. Monsieur, I implore you. You see how it is? What can I say? My good girl, said Simon harshly, don't be a fool. Nobody thinks you saw or heard anything. You'll be quite all right. I'll look after you. Nobody's accusing you of anything. Louise seems to be in the clear, but Poirot has one more bomb to drop before he lets her go. Poirot said, Do you know anything about your mistress's pearls? Her pearls? Louise's eyes opened very wide. She was wearing them last night. Where did she put them? On the table, by the side, as always. That is where you last saw them? Yes, monsieur. Did you see them there this morning? A startled look came into the girl's face. Mon Dieu, I did not even look. You did not look, but I. I have the eyes which notice... And there were no pearls on the table beside the bed this morning. The pearls have been mentioned a few times during the book, and they are extravagant. They are worth forty or fifty thousand dollars, which in 1920 uh, was a lot of money. So now we have another crime, the theft of the pearls. And to me, it just doesn't make sense for Jackie or Simon to be behind this um, because, well, Simon owns the pearls now. There's no reason to take them. Uh, perhaps they use the pearls to pay off a confederate to actually do the deed. Um, the other possibility would, it would be that this is just a second crime that has happened to take place on the very same night as the murder, in which case, uh, whoever did it has got to be feeling like an idiot because the heat is going to be on. All right, the gun has been found. They have dragged the Nile and found the gun still wrapped up in Marie Van Schuyler's stole. And the stole has a couple of bullet holes in it, indicating that it's been used to muffle a gunshot. So to me, this just bears out my whole theory of a premeditated crime with Jackie and Simon staging this fight in order to construct their alibis. The stole was taken before the incident in the salon, so I feel like they were getting the pieces into place uh, for their master crime. Poirot says, though, that the stole wouldn't muffle the shot a great deal, and I tend to agree. So the more I think about it, the more I think the murder happened had to happen here on the timeline, uh, during the whole incident in the salon or right after, because this is when things are noisy. People are running back and forth. Jackie is, is hysterical, screaming, Simon, Simon, what have I done? And this is when a gunshot might perhaps not have been heard. The rest of the evening is fairly quiet. People are, um, you know, they're hearing splashes, but nobody's hearing a gunshot. So I feel like this is when the murder had to happen. This is going to make me revisit the question of whether Bowers could possibly be a confederate of Jackie and Simon. Uh, my initial theory was that perhaps Bowers crept out during the night while she was providing Jacqueline with an alibi, um, but that doesn't really work. That's the quiet part of the night. So what about, what about Louise Bourget? Louise is Lynette's maid. She was with her just before uh, she was shot, supposedly. Well, what if she stayed a little longer and did her in? In that case, Jackie and Simon could have perhaps used the pearls to pay Louise off, although she did seem genuinely surprised that they were missing, so that is a bit of a wrinkle. A look of utter astonishment passed over Colonel Race's face as he picked up the pearls from the table. This is most extraordinary, he said. Will you kindly explain, Miss Bowers? Of course, that's what I've come to do. And just what is the truth? Did you take these pearls from Mrs. Doyle's cabin? Oh, no, Colonel Riss, of course not. Miss Van Schuyler did. 
Miss Van Schuyler? Yes. She can't help it, you know, but she does, um, take things, especially jewelry. That's really why I'm always with her. It's not her health at all. It's this little idiosyncrasy. I keep on the alert, and fortunately, there's never been any trouble since I've been with her. All right, so Marie Van Schuyler took the pearls. Marie Van Schuyler is apparently a kleptomaniac, and this is the secret that Miss Bowers has been keeping for her. So this is the end of the Miss Bowers suspect subplot. Uh, I've said before on this channel that you can think of your suspects as subplots. The subplot begins when we begin to get curious about that suspect, when we begin to suspect that they have a reason for doing something illicit, and it ends when we uh, absolve them of responsibility for the main crime and kind of find out what their secrets are and resolve all the questions that we've spun up about them during the plot. So Miss Bower's subplot began at the beginning of the book when we found out that she has some sort of secret and it ends right here with all of her secrets revealed. However, Poirot examines the pearls and it turns out they're fake, which is just extremely confusing. So it appears we have two crimes happening on the exact same night. Marie Van Schuyler's theft of the pearls and the murder of Lynette Doyle by someone as yet unknown. However, before either of these crimes were committed, somebody replaced the pearls with fake ones. So the obvious suspect here is Louise Bourget, but currently she's my pick for Simon and Jackie's confederate. And if I were her, I just would not mix these two crimes. Uh, adding a major theft to your murder seems like a great way to get caught because you're going to be leaving behind extra evidence and just presenting more questions to the investigators. All right, let's get back to that second splash. Marie Van Schuyler says she knows exactly what caused it. She went out on the deck and saw Rosalie Otterborn throwing something over the side of the boat. Poir Poirot confronts her and it turns out that Rosalie's mother, Salome Otterborn, is a secret alcoholic. So Rosalie found her stash and was throwing it overboard to dispose of it. Here we have the end of the Otterborn suspect subplot, but it does not seem to get us any closer to closing the case. And did you see anyone at all when you looked down the deck? There was a pause, quite a long pause. Rosalie was frowning. She seemed to be thinking earnestly. At last, she shook her head quite decisively. No, she said. I saw nobody. Hercule Poirot slowly nodded his head, but his eyes were grave. On the other hand, maybe this subplot is going to give us a little more information. So this is always a great thing to do with your suspect subplots, to give them some way of hooking into the main plot or into another one of the suspect subplots. And that's what's happening right here. Rosalie is giving us a clue that's going to resolve something else about the book. Okay, she seems to be protecting somebody who she saw out on the deck. So who would that be? Well, Obviously, she wants to protect her mother, that's clear, uh, but she wouldn't hesitate if it were her mother. She'd just flat out say no. It's somebody who she wasn't quite sure whether she wanted to protect. So who would that be? Well, her biggest traveling buddies are Tim Allerton and his mother, Mrs. Allerton. Uh, everyone keeps talking about how nice Mrs. Allerton is, how sweet, how charming, and she is nice. Uh, so is she the kind of person who perhaps Rosalie would want to protect and could she have a deep, dark secret? If you're enjoying this video so far and you feel like it's giving you value, uh, please give this video a like and then let's get back to the book. Simon asks for Jackie to be brought to his room. She stepped in after him, wavered, stood still, standing there mute and dumb, her eyes fixed on Simon's face. Hello, Jackie. He too was embarrassed. He went on. Awfully good of you to come. I wanted to say, I mean, what I mean is... She interrupted him then. Her words came out in a rush, breathless, desperate. Simon, I didn't kill Lynette. You know, I didn't do that. I, I was mad last night. Oh, can you ever forgive me? Words came more easily to him now. Of course, that's all right. Absolutely all right. That's what I wanted to say. Thought you might be worrying a bit, you know. Worrying a bit? Oh, Simon. Right, they are already starting to construct the narrative of their reconciliation. And if I were them, honestly, I would slow play this a little bit more, but they seem to be in a hurry to get back together. So yeah, I'm more convinced than ever. And if you remember that sun and moon metaphor from the beginning of the book, uh, this is another clue. Uh, they use the exact same metaphor to describe their relationship. So 
This could be something they said during a fight while they were breaking up. You know, it's like you just can't see me anymore. She's the sun and I'm the moon. But I think they cooked that up. I think they cooked up a whole narrative about how Lynette stole Simon away. And this is all their plan. Well, Louise Bourget has gone missing. So they are going to search her cabin and see if they can find her. Louise's shoes were lined along by the bed. One of them, a black patent leather, seemed to be resting at an extraordinary angle, almost unsupported. The appearance of it was so odd that it attracted Race's attention. He closed the suitcase and bent over the line of shoes. Then he uttered a sharp exclamation. Poirot world round. Qu'est-ce qu'il y a? Race said grimly. She hasn't disappeared. She's here. Under the bed. Louise is dead and in her hand is just a little scrap of paper that is the just the torn off edge of a note of currency. So this would fit very well with my theory. Simon and Jackie paid her off to kill Lynette and now they've decided to cut her out so that she cannot tell their story. Well, Salome Otterborn has something to say about Louise. Besna had not closed the door. Only the curtain hung across the open doorway. Mrs. Otterborn swept it to one side and entered like a tornado. Her face was suffused with color, her gait slightly unsteady, her command of words not quite under her control. Mr. Doyle, she said dramatically, I know who killed your wife. You will agree, will you not, that whoever killed Louise Bourget also killed Lynette Doyle? That the two crimes were committed by one and the same hand? Yes, yes, said Simon impatiently. Of course, that stands to reason. Go on. Then my assertion holds. I know who killed Louise Bourget. Therefore, I know who killed Lynette Doyle. You mean you have a theory as to who killed Louise Bourget, suggested Race skeptically. Mrs. Otterborn turned on him like a tiger. No, I have exact knowledge. I saw the person with my own eyes. Race said, and that person was... Bang! The noise of the explosion filled the cabin. There was an acrid, sour smell of smoke. Mrs. Otterborn turned slowly sideways, as though in supreme inquiry... Then her body slumped forward and she fell to the ground with a crash. From just behind her ear, the blood flowed from a round, neat hole. Salome Otterborn was about to spill the goods and she got offed. Poro and Race do a search of the ship to try and find the gun that killed Salome, and it turns out to have belonged to Pennington. So now is their opportunity to confront Pennington, not just about why his gun was used, but about his fake story of supposedly meeting Lynette on her honeymoon purely by accident. Monsieur Pennington, we do not believe a word of your story. The hell you don't know what the hell do you believe? We believe that Lynette Ridgeway's unexpected marriage put you in a financial quandary, that you came over post haste to try and find some way out of the mess you are in, that is to say, some way of gaining time, that with that end in view, you endeavored to obtain Madame Doyle's signature to certain documents and failed, that on the journey up the Nile, when walking along the cliff top at Abu Simbul, you dislodged a boulder which fell and only very narrowly missed its object. Pennington close to admits that he wanted Lynette dead because he has been speculating with her money and Simon would be much easier to control. Uh, he's not quite willing to confess, but it's just as good as a confession because it's clear that that's exactly what happened. I suppose, mused Poirot, that the boulder was a sudden temptation. You thought nobody saw you. That was a, an accident. I swear, it, it was an accident. The man leaned forward, his face working, his eyes terrified. I stumbled and fell against it. I swear it was an accident. The two men said nothing. And that's a wrap on Pennington's suspect subplot. Well, the matter of Rick Hetty's telegram being opened by Lynette comes up and this triggers something for race. A new code. It was used in the South African rebellion. Potatoes mean machine guns. Artichokes are high explosives and so on. Ricchetti is no more an archaeologist than I am. He's a very dangerous agitator, a man who's killed more than once, and I'll swear that he's killed once again. Mrs. Doyle opened that telegram by mistake, you see. If she were ever to repeat what was in it before me, he knew his goose would be cooked. Okay, so I'm right about Ricchetti, I'm right about the code, uh, but I think that Race is wrong about Ricchetti killing Lynette. I just don't think this was enough of a motive for him. Um, you know, I don't think that Lynette was that close to figuring out who he was. And I'm still stuck on my theory that it's Simon and Jackie pulling all the strings. And then we wrap up Tim Allerton's suspect subplot. It turns out that he was the jewel thief. He replaced Lynette's original pearls with the fakes, uh, which a cousin of his had made for him in England. And then, of course, 
Marie Van Schuyler stole the fakes. So Tim Allerton is guilty of theft, but not murder. And at the end of his subplot, we learn that he and Rosalie Otterborn are going to become a couple. So this is the other fun thing that you can do with suspect subplots. Uh, not just answer the questions we've had, but also tell a story about the people who we've come to know along the way. All right, I think that Poirot's getting close to wrapping up the case, and that's because he's doing a little bit of a pre-wrap-up. He's sort of laying out the clues that he's uncovered along the way. There is the statement of Mademoiselle de Belfort that someone overheard our conversation that night in the garden at Aswan. There is the statement of Monsieur Tim Allerton as to what he heard and did on the night of the crime. There are Louise Bourget's significant answers to our questions this morning. There is the fact that Madame Allerton drinks water, that her son drinks whiskey and soda, and that I drink wine. Add to that the fact of two bottles of nail polish and the proverb I quoted. And finally, we come to the crux of the whole business. The fact that the pistol was wrapped up in a cheap handkerchief and a velvet stole and thrown overboard. Race was silent a minute or two, then he shook his head. No, he said, I don't see it. Yeah, uh, you and me both, buddy. Uh, I do not know what Poirot is going on about here. Uh, those two bottles of nail polish, those were discovered when we did a search of the boat to find the gun that killed Salome Otterborn, and I don't know what Poirot's getting from them. And as for this whole, I drink wine and Mrs. Allerton drinks water, I got nothing. But he does explain his comment about the significant remarks of Louise Bourget. Uh, it turns out that when Louise saw Simon in her cabin, she was hinting about the fact that she had seen something. And I, I do remember her saying, if I had gone out on the deck, then maybe I had seen something. So if she's hinting, uh, she's not hinting to Poirot, who she could just give the information to. She's hinting to Simon. She is trying to let him know that she's on to him. She's blackmailing him. And when he assures her, oh, don't worry, nobody's accusing you. You'll be all right. I'll take care of you. He's saying, I'll pay you off. So then what must have happened is Jackie went to pay Louise off and killed her either, uh, because that was her intention all along and she only brought the money along to sort of lull Louise into a false sense of security or because things got a little heated. So that leaves me with no theory about who did it and how. I, I still think that Simon could not have done it, that Jackie could not have done it. Louise uh, seems to have been blackmailing Simon rather than being a accomplice who got cut out. Um, Bowers? No, I don't think so. I don't think... I, we already have her secret. Her secret is about Marie Van Schuyler, and while it's possible for her to have a second secret, it's, it's not really the done thing in mysteries. Typically, once you wrap a suspect subplot, that's it. Tim Allerton is wrapped up. Ricketti is wrapped up. The Otterborns are wrapped up. And so I'm left with sweet little Cornelia Robson? To be honest, I don't know who the killer is, but I am going to go ahead and let Poirot tell me. Then one night on this boat, I thought I heard Simon and Lynette outside my cabin. He was saying, we've got to go through with it now. It was Doyle, all right, but it was to Jacqueline he was speaking. The final drama was perfectly planned and timed. There was a sleeping draft for me in case I might put an inconvenient finger in the pie. There was the selection of Mademoiselle Robson as a witness the working up of the scene, Mademoiselle de Belfort's exaggerated remorse and hysterics. She made a good deal of noise in case the shot should be heard en vérité. It was an extraordinarily clever idea. Jacqueline says she has shot Doyle. Mademoiselle Robson says so. Fantorp says so. And when Simon's leg is examined, he has been shot. It looks unanswerable. For both of them, there is a perfect alibi. All right, Simon. Simon is our shooter. It was, after all, a time-shifted alibi. I feel so irritated with myself. So what happened was Jackie did not shoot Simon in the salon. Uh, of course she didn't. It, it only makes sense uh, because why would she? If his alibi is supposed to be that he was shot, well, 
shooting him herself is actually not the best way to achieve that. Uh, she might miss him. She might graze him. Either of those would not give him the alibi or she might actually kill him. Uh, it's so much safer, so much more reliable for him to grab the gun and shoot himself. So that bottle of nail polish that Poirot called out, uh, that bottle was actually containing red dye. He points out that the color on the label is rose, but it contains dark red coloring. So what Simon and Jackie did is they staged the fight, uh, and then she shoots the gun, presumably into the floor or out the window, and then Simon collapses holding the bottle of red dye and a handkerchief against his leg so that we see a spreading blood stain. Then he tells Cornelia and Fanthorpe to take care of Jackie and make sure she's not left alone. Well, that leaves him alone. He grabs the gun, runs down the hall, shoots Lynette, comes back, and then shoots himself using Marie Van Schuyler's stole around the gun to muffle that gunshot. Gun goes out the window, we hear a splash, and that's the crime. And I just, ah, I feel so frustrated because I, I just, I just plum forgot that in a time-shifted alibi, and that's what this is, it is a time-shifted alibi, we think the alibi starts here, it actually starts here. Um, we always believe we see the alibi begin. That is the central deception in a time-shifted alibi. So that is a great mystery, and I want to take just a minute to take a look at another tactic that Dame Agatha has left behind for us to admire. In the moment where Poirot is doing his pre-wrap-up and telling us what are the central clues, he mentions the nail polish. And let's take just a second to look at the scene where the nail polish is discovered. There were various creams, powders, face lotions, but the only thing that seemed to interest Poirot were two little bottles labeled Nail X. He picked them up at last and brought them to the dressing table. One which bore the inscription Nail X Rose was empty, but for a drop or two of dark red fluid at the bottom. The other, the same size, but labeled Nail X Cardinal was nearly full. So here is the relevant information about this clue. And here, this is all the irrelevant information. And I love this, this tactic, packing relevant information in with a bunch of irrelevant details. But because essentially what Poirot is doing here is he's pushing a little haystack across the table to us and telling us that the needle is in there somewhere. It's still very difficult for us readers to ferret out the exact right information to latch onto, even though we know we've been given the central clue. And here, again, with the whiskey, water, wine comment he made, well, all he's really trying to say is that his wine was drugged, but he's saying it in the most complicated way imaginable, stuffing his summary with irrelevant details so that we can't really see the true picture. Well, I had a blast making this video, but I have to admit that I feel beaten and I kind of want to try again with another Agatha Christie novel. Uh, if I do that though, I am first going to review all of the perfect alibi solutions that I came up with in this video. I broke down tons of perfect alibis that all work in different ways and kind of described exactly what a writer needs to make each of these work.